April is Fair Housing Month, and today our speaker is Dr. Love Jones. She is the Human Rights Director for the City of Greensboro from 2013 to the present. So a little bit about her. She has dedicated her entire professional journey to understanding the needs of people, both individually and collectively. She believes that people who develop solid personal and professional identities build successful connections across several types of relationships. She believes in a systems approach with the need to address from a holistic space. She has 15 years of experience in seminar, workshop, and curriculum design and facilitation. She earned a bachelor's as a double major in psychology and communication studies from our very own University of North Carolina Greensboro. That's awesome. She also earned her MS from East Carolina in marriage and family therapy out of the School of Human Ecology. She also earned a doctorate in cultural studies with a concentration in communication studies out of UNCG Greensboro School of Education. She's genuinely interested in the way people establish identity and build community. Currently, she does serve as the role of the executive with the city of Greensboro, the director of human relations department, which is the human rights arms of the local government. She continues her work as an educator, teaching both interpersonal and organizational communication to both traditional and non-traditional college populations. She's the founder of Interwoven Consulting Company. She also spends time with her family and friends and her personal interests include slam poetry, mixed media art, and all things live music. And she has a very long, um, lots of accolades and things that I read through. So I'm super excited to have her here. Welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I, I really cannot express how grateful I am when the opportunity presents itself to talk with members of the community, be it housing provider or housing recipient, you know, about um, the needs associated with fair housing rights. Um, this is a very critical topic. And so I'm very grateful um, for the invitation. I'm grateful to everyone who was involved with the preparation for the event. Um, and I just really appreciate the fact that the that G GRRA is committed to having these conversations and holding events that focus on this topic because it really is vital. What I have been asked to do is to begin the conversation first with the reading of the proclamation um, from the office of the mayor on behalf of the mayor. After that, we will hear a few key highlight statements from me, but what I'm really most excited about is the opportunity to engage in dialogue. So first, please allow me to read our proclamation. Whereas on April 11th, 1968, the Congress of the United States of America passed the Fair Housing Act as amended in 1974 and 1988, prohibiting discrimination in the sale, financing, or rental of housing because of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, and national origin. And whereas the City of Greensboro Human Relations Department was approved by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development as a fair housing assistance program in 1995 and is charged with enforcing fair housing laws within the city of Greensboro as a substantially equivalent agency. And whereas the city of Greensboro supports fair housing efforts to eliminate discrimination in housing and the human relations department educates residents and housing providers on the fair housing ordinance and investigates complaints of housing discrimination in Greensboro. And today, many realty companies and associations support fair housing laws. And whereas the city of Greensboro wants to focus attention and heighten public awareness in April as Fair Housing Month. Now, therefore, I, Nancy Vaughn, mayor of the city of Greensboro, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2021 as Fair Housing Month in Greensboro and commend the observance to our citizens and encourage all residents and organizations to celebrate the value of diverse neighborhoods and support the goal of equal housing opportunities for all people. That statement, that proclamation is 
all encapsulating of how important it is for Greensboro to take the lead on ensuring that people have equitable access to housing. And I count it a privilege to be the leader of the department once named Human Relations, now recently in October of 2020, named Human Rights Department, counted an honor and a privilege to lead that charge. We have an amazing staff of people who are very, very committed to the proper intake and investigation of fair housing claims. But what I'm most excited about is our commitment to community education and an opportunity to engage housing providers as well as housing seekers so that we can have a more harmonious experience from the beginning so that we don't have to encounter issues of discrimination. The goal in the end is for people to equally be able to access and enjoy the use of a dwelling, to feel a sense of safety and wholeness in this community. I was asked previously what it is that I would address today and that, uh, outline still remains. I want to talk a little bit about the trends that we see in fair housing investigation out of our office. And then I want to talk a little bit about ways in which we have enhanced our accountability mechanisms. And then in the end, I just want to talk about how important it is for us to keep these opportunities of bi-directional education going so that people know at the forefront what the best practices are and what the reasonable expectations are when either providing or seeking housing. But after that, I'm most excited about the opportunity to engage your questions. So first and foremost, you know, I think it's important for us to always remember that fair housing is indeed a right. It is not a privilege, it's not an opportunity, it's not something set aside for those who work the hardest and secure you know, um, a reasonable income to the best of their ability and therefore they deserve housing. A lot of times we have to rethink the way in which we use words like opportunity versus right. And in this instance, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't lead out in this conversation with the notion that fair housing is and always should be a right. And in that, we have to dig deeper in the understanding of what one has a right to. There is one thing for us, it is one thing for us to have a right to access and use. Those are two very critical pieces. One, you must you must be able to secure housing and then use it for its intended function. But I think that there's a piece that is outlined by HUD that we sometimes forget, and that is the enjoyment of a dwelling as well. It's use and enjoyment. And when we think about enjoyment, we definitely have learned to take anything that is attached to joy and convert it to privilege as opposed to a right we have somehow worked our way from seeing joy as a right. But if joy is the bedfellow of peace, and if to have a home is designed to bring one a sense of peace and wholeness, then joy is the natural accompaniment. So when we have concerns in our community about people not having the ability to enjoy access to and, and enjoy use of a dwelling, that is an equally critical concern. And that always broadens our understanding of what fair housing work is and should be. And so if I could go a step further and talk about when we see that enjoyment compromised most often, um, it, while it's across all seven protected classes, here recently it's definitely been more so attached to some specific protected classes. As we know, the seven protected classes include race, religion, national origin, disability, sex, familial status, and color. However, we are recently seeing a significant uptick in the discrimination or at least allegations of discrimination against those who fall into the protected class of being differently abled or disabled. As a matter of fact, our trend right now is that 70% of the intakes that we do in our office are associated with disability. 
So specifically, it's about making sure in most instances that a dwelling is properly outfitted in order to meet the needs of differently abled populations. What's even richer about this trend is that it is not the, it's not solely um, focused on physically differently abled populations, but also mental health trends have emerged in the complaints through our um, office. And so sometimes what that looks like is maybe a housing provider who has to do inspections has to maintain a particular volume when they speak in order not to uh, compromise the sense of calm and to reduce anxiety in the home because sometimes children and sometimes adults have challenges that are compromised whenever their environment is disrupted. So a reasonable request is to ask, believe it or not, is to ask that when a when a, a maintenance person or a housing provider for any reason is coming into the home, if they are asked to maintain a certain voice volume in order to keep perhaps a child who um, needs certain sensory stability because of being on the spectrum for autism or what have you, like those things are actual reasonable accommodation requests. And so we have seen definitely a, a serious uptick in challenges and questions about whether or not housing providers are meeting reasonable accommodations in the dwelling. Another category that has been most recently upticked in our, our office is sex. So traditionally, it's about, you know, well, do you treat a person the same way, whether they're male or female, when they are attempting to access, secure, or maintain a dwelling? Well, most specifically, we have seen an uptick in quid pro quo cases, basically attached to sexual harassment of some kind. And so we have found ourselves really, really trying to delve into, learn, and understand how these cases are emerging so that we can then strategize how to get out in front of those, those concerns and educate the community better, be it housing providers, about the appropriate ways to conduct you know, themselves, but then also um, equally educating residents about the rights that they have and what to look for when it comes to quid pro quo cases. What's most interesting right now is that we're seeing an intersection with familial status. So you take any of the protected classes, families with children, familial status, those cases are on an uptick as well. So many times we are encountering situations where in addition to race or in addition to uh, disability discrimination, it's also about homes with children involved. And that really speaks to um, a critical challenge that's associated with COVID that I'm going to talk about um, in, in just a moment. But one thing that we have also tried to be mindful of is gauging the trends associated with private landlords versus agencies. And what we find is that the more specific, spot on, very in your face versions of discrimination happen a little more often with private landlord situations and overwhelmingly it's policy and procedural challenges for agencies. And so we have to approach those two matters equally when it comes to the application of the law, but definitely in the way that remedies um, emerge, it looks a little bit different. And so I'll talk about that in a few moments as well. So we've got more challenges with disabled populations, more challenges um, associated with quid pro quo um, for sex discrimination, and then the overarching trend of any of the protected classes intersecting most often with familial status. So these very layered and complex cases are coming into our office. What's important to note is that COVID has changed so much about the way in which claims of discrimination emerge, are investigated, and are remedied. So first and foremost, it's important to note that when we're talking about cases associated with COVID, 
it is attached to by way of protected classes, most often disability. The assumption is that the property owner and or housing provider has failed to do certain things to make the dwelling inhabitable because I am perceived to have COVID, have been exposed to COVID, et cetera. And it's been really interesting to navigate where the bounds of safety fall for both housing providers and housing seekers when it comes to a pandemic where, you know, this, this, the challenges are varied and competing. You know, for on the one hand, you want to look out for the interest of the population that is, you know, seeking housing, wanting to have a safe and affordable dwelling. And so if they need repairs done, you definitely don't want to make people settle or, or encourage them to think that they should settle for whenever the pandemic wraps up. That's when someone will come in and fix your dwelling. On the other hand, it's also critical to consider that if a person living in a dwelling is not willing to engage in the proper precautions to protect the person going in to make the repairs, that indeed it's important to educate that housing seeker and the person maintaining the dwelling about making sure that the safety is bi-directional. So we've had to do a lot of education around that challenge because at that point disability is uh, the way in which those cases are processed because if it's perceived that the person is not receiving services because of a physical, mental um, challenge of any kind, then that falls under the category of disability. On the other hand, we have issues with failure, failure to repair. And that actually does not necessarily fall under the fair housing law, but it's a part of what we manage in our landlord tenant dispute program. We have a separate initiative that is designed to ensure that we can get people as close to conciliation um, mediation as possible when there is no issue of discrimination on the table, but merely conflictual or opposing views. So one of the things that, of course, once the moratorium was established to prevent eviction, there were calls that we received from people who lived in rental properties who were saying, well, the issue is that I need my toilet fixed and and the landlord is not willing to come in and make the repair. The manager of the property is not willing to send someone out. And so upon communicating with the, with the housing provider, be it manager or landlord, et cetera, we learned that the failure to pay creates a failure to repair. Now, in some instances, it really is a one for one in that the way in which the dwelling is maintained in part is based on the in the rental income because the property has yet to be paid for. And so as a result, that exchange has to happen. Now, what we know is that there's still an obligation to provide a, a safe dwelling. So what we've had to do is educate housing providers on the necessity of securing the funds in order to make repairs that compromise safety because of the fact that it is legally sufficient that they are not receiving payment for the dwelling at the time until the moratoriums were going to lift. And so that's been a really difficult conversation, especially for our um, smaller, more private um, housing provider situations with corporations. We haven't really had those challenges and larger agencies. But ultimately the work that we have had to do in the wake of COVID has been laced with desperation. And I think that sensitivity to desperation, be it on the part of the housing seeker or the housing provider has been critical for our staff to maintain. Just that sense of empathy. Um, because in these critical times, it is very easy for desperation to teeter into poor practice. And so, especially when it comes to issues of discrimination, when people are looking for ways to open their property up to someone who may be able to, who may be able to afford to stay in the dwelling, 
then we have seen a trend of people using things that are not necessarily substantial to promote, urge, or encourage people to leave the dwelling. And usually it does teeter on some sort of discriminatory practice. Either they've made it harder for the children to function in the dwelling or in the community. It's been um, definitely the reemergence of those issues of quid pro quo. You give me this, I'll give you that. If you don't give me this, then oh, here are a host of violations that merit you no longer being able to reside in the property. And the underlying piece to that in many instances is the financial shortage that has come from the moratorium. And so the urgency to get perhaps a more viable tenant into a property um, has definitely influenced some desperate actions. In all of this, in all of these trends, accountability is where we come in. We are not on the side of the landlord or the housing provider or the realtor, um, the real estate company or the agency. We are not on the side of the housing seeker, but we are very much so the vehicle to educate and then enforce the standards that are established by our Fair Housing Act. And so the first step for us is always education. So these are the opportunities we look forward to most because it enables us to touch housing seekers and providers to hopefully prevent discrimination. But is it just enough when we do encounter acts of discrimination to have the respondent correct the action? No. And what we have concentrated on, especially in the last four or five years of my tenure um, with the agency, is being able to cultivate remedies early and often where we have found cause for discrimination. And we have found that to be the greatest motivator for change, unfortunately, because people must be accountable for the distress and inconvenience that comes with discrimination. It is not enough to just stop discriminating. It is about the restoration of wholeness for people who have been discriminated against. And so last year, I believe we totaled out at about $70,000 in uh, fiscal remedies for respondents. I mean, I'm sorry, for complainants in the community against respondents. Um, some cases were in the couple of thousands, other cases went upward to 15 or 20,000. And part of, the, part of the purpose in that is not just because everyone responds best to financial responsibility, but it's because of the fact that there are actual things that happen while a person is being discriminated against that cost not only time and energy and, and some sort of sense of wholeness, but also it costs money. So a lot of our remedy calculations are associated with things like the days of work missed attempting to, to secure new housing and or manage a challenging housing situation, the cost of relocation altogether. Um, sometimes it's the recourse of rent or, or some sort of um, payment that shouldn't have been made on behalf of the complainant while experiencing uh, discrimination. And then other times it's just about restoring the cost burden for modifications and adaptations that have been made out of pocket because a housing provider isn't willing to make them. In any rate, at any rate, there is a calculation of, you know, distress, but it's woven into and, and accompanied by some very factual things that have been cost burdensome for the complainant. But what we really appreciate on top of the fiscal remedies is the ability to enforce some sort of public remedy that involves training or a commitment to review of policy and procedure. Because being hit hard once, slapped on the wrist, however you wanna say it, by way of a financial, uh, a, a financial responsibility is one thing, but it is equally critical for there to be long-term impact from the investigation. So we have definitely been committed to doing trainings, 
um, and having policy and procedural review whereby it is written out in the agreement that in addition to any financial remedies that they provide the complainant, that they will then partner with our office for a term of sometimes six months, a year to engage in more in-depth training and allow us to accompany them as they review policy and procedure to ensure that discriminatory practices don't happen. So the accountability piece is definitely um, something that we go back to the drawing table on over and over again to uphold the standards of HUD, but also tailor them to what's happening in Greensboro. So that creative remedy piece is really important. And we're thankful that so far, the way that we've moved forward with remedies has been effective. The last piece that I'll speak to is the core of what has to happen if we are going to eradicate issues of housing discrimination. Bi-directional education is critical. All housing providers don't necessarily mean harm. And all housing seekers are not 100% innocent. And that's why we don't pick a side. We don't see ourselves as the advocates for any particular group. But what we do understand is that whether you intend to cause harm, it doesn't mean you're not accountable if harm is caused. And so for us, the key is to be preventive. So first and foremost, providers need to be educated about the best and safest practices. I say best and safest because there has to be a compassion element to why we are trying to change the tide of discrimination. To just see it as best practices assumes that the key is to just make sure that we reduce liability. But if we're really talking about equitable, safe, fair, and affordable housing where people have authentic use and access to the enjoyment of a dwelling, there has to be a compassion piece to that. So it's not about just the best practices, but it's about the safest practices. So that includes trainings about trends, especially. People know the basics of the Fair Housing Act. Most agencies have a checkbox of what you can and can't do, what you should and shouldn't do. But what happens when a pandemic unfolds? And all of a sudden there, there are nuances to the way in which people navigate housing specific situations. We have to be, be very intentional and move early and often on the opportunity to say, how is what's happening or changing in the world around us impacting the way that we provide safe, fair and affordable housing? So looking at those trends is vital, but also we have to broaden, always keep our broad interpretation of who qualifies as a housing provider. Provider is not just the person who hands you the keys as the owner. It's really about looking at the practices of realtors because realtors are a vehicle of access. Also, it's important to look at the practices of lenders because when we're talking about home ownership, that's a whole different category of ways in which discrimination um, can, can manifest itself. So keeping that umbrella really, really broad as far as the understanding of what it means to be a provider, which means that any version of provider can be held accountable. But then it's important, and this is where I'll close, for seekers, housing seekers to be educated early and often about rights, but also expectations. We aren't in our office just slam dunking cases left and right, cause, cause, cause for discrimination. That's not how it's operating. Even though we're getting allegations, sometimes those allegations don't pan out to be a cause case. And that is because housing seekers are not always aware of what it, what, what's really required in order to best advocate for themselves if they have unique needs upon securing a dwelling. So we have tried to spend as much time as possible working through agencies that are the initial stop point for people seeking housing so that we can get to audiences early and often to talk about how you need to advocate for yourself if you are differently abled or if you are a newcomer to the community by way of immigrant and refugee status. You know, what are the things that you need to know about what you can realistically expect and what has to be very clear and articulated and cannot be left to chance if these are things that you need to have a positive experience in, in a dwelling. 
So as you as you've had a chance to hear in these few few minutes that I've been speaking, this is a very complex and layered process that we embrace wholeheartedly. What's the next step is for us to continue to educate the community about why it should be embraced wholeheartedly by everyone. Because again, to live in Greensboro in a safe, secure and affordable dwelling where you enjoy the use and access to that dwelling is the real goal for housing in Greensboro. Thank you so much for your time. And now I'm excited to hear any questions that are coming in through the chat. Again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. That was a lot of wonderful information. So if somebody needed to find out more or wanted to file a complaint, something like that, what, what, how would they go about doing that? Where would they go? You can go to the human rights page on the city of Greensboro website. Um, all you have to do is put fair housing into the search box and it'll take you directly to a fair housing portal if there's a, a specific complaint that needs to be filed. But if someone is looking just for general edu education, you can contact our office at 373-2038. Alan Hunt is our primary uh, complaint officer or our primary investigator. So he is the first stop in securing additional training and um, additional education. Wonderful. We do have a question in and it's Tammy says, thank you for speaking today, Dr. Jones. We'd love to know what you can share about affordable housing in the next stimulus package and what committee chairman Sherrod Brown had to say this week about buy down rate build up equity, which would offer low income or first time buyers a 20 year amortization equal to a 30 year mortgage. Do you know anything about that? Well, I do know some, I, I would be remiss if I were to dive deeply because I don't wanna speak out of turn because really any of those initiatives are actually handled out of our neighborhood development office. That's actually not the human rights office. Stan Wilson, who was the director of neighborhood development they, their office is the recipients of any incentivized programming funding or any incentivized initiatives to carry out on behalf of HUD. Um, all of that comes through their office to include even some of the CARE Act funds that people are making use of now as far as rent, uh, as far as restoring rental status, um, things like that. So I'm always careful not to step in Stan's wheelhouse. In the grand scheme of things, is this a, is this a solid enough beginning to talking about creative ways to, to, to give greater access to those who would normally be marginalized from securing long-term housing? Sure, um, there, there, there's definitely a, that's definitely a step. What I focus on more so is the education piece about how when you are able to be the recipient or participate in an initiative, our office sometimes partners with neighborhood development in order to look more deeply at how to ensure that this is a sustainable solution. Because sometimes an incentive by itself um, is not the end all beat all, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Okay, great. Any other questions? Any other ones? Mike, do you Dr. Jones, uh, what do you what do you think? You, there's a lot of restricted covenants out there in Greensboro. A lot of housing have restricted covenants. Uh, developments have restricted covenants, and a lot of folks who are buying those those properties are not um, don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And so there's a disconnect because restricted covenants aren't, aren't in a, a native language. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest the realtor helps them understand what they're buying into? Well, one of the things that we've tried to do is in every, and with every trend that we see that impacts our international populations, we have an outreach and education um, coordinator, Jody Stanley, who is actually the supervisor of the city's, the coordinator of the city's language access plan. So all of our internal efforts, we have tried to weave those efforts into all of our outreach because we do have such a high representation of international um, representation in our city. 
So what becomes vital is for agencies to become committed to reviewing their own language access plans, because by federal law, depending upon the way in which funds are accessed and the way in which some housing providers are sustained, um, it becomes imperative. It's not just an option. It's absolutely obligatory that you get all of the information properly translated and that you have interpretation on site. So it really does depend on the title source for your funding. But aside from that, just the literally the good faith effort of ensuring that any person who is attempting to secure housing has the proper language support in order to be fully knowledgeable of what they are signing up for as far as you know the way in which the dwelling is utilized and and the way in which you navigate the use of it period i think that that's a good faith effort even that exceeds federal mandate so you you would you would suggest at least if they can get a copy of the get them and get a copy of the restricted covenants maybe get somebody find somebody who speaks their language who can translate for them absolutely and and either i guess go over it at least go over it yes and the thing is it's also important to understand that language access is connected to official documents that some of the mandates are are more stringent for um for for legal documents and so that qualifies as a legal transaction and so in those instances it is actually imperative that you do the due diligence at least to put some language support in place if the housing seeker rejects that um, resource then there is no liability but it's the due diligence to at least provide it is critical yeah, I think that the big problem, you have all these homeowners associations who have all these documents out there and they're in English. They don't have the wherewithal to do any of this. And uh, and then our poor realtors are sitting there trying to help them explain to them and, and they, you know, they don't speak a lot of English. Um, and so and so what would you do in that case? Well, the other part is that and I, and I wanna to speak to this because this is usually what comes about with language access support. People get concerned about it being cost burdensome, but the truth of the matter is that language line is a free resource <laughs> that many um, agencies could very well use. Um, it's also cost effective to secure a relationship with local um, language interpretation agencies. And usually there is a way to, by way of packaging your, your use of the service as opposed to like one for one, for it to be more cost effective. So just establishing it as a part of your standard operating procedure can be cost effective. Because at the end of the day, it, like I said, if you have a housing seeker who is eager to move forward, not as interested in understanding, you know, the documents and the process, which does happen, you know, there is no liability there. But if as a realtor, when you look at this document in, in good faith alone, if you know that there are things that are critical for, for this housing seeking party to know before walking into this transaction, then it's really important to just do the due diligence to have some resources on deck so that if you are not capable of, of, of making it clear what's outlined in the covenant, then nonetheless, it's not that they're without the support to do so. Okay. Heather, I think there's one there from Sophia. I think Sophia statement. was um, just putting in that there's a CARES Act funding assist, assist the renters and mortgage holders okay. for the city of Greensboro through her Greensboro Housing Coalition and the Housing Co Co Consultants Group. Yes. Just bring that in there. Yes. Um, and then we have a lot of thank yous, great information from our attendees. So thank you so much, Mike. Did you have any other questions? I just said, uh, do, do, you, do you ever get calls about uh, from, from, from folks upset regarding realtors who are listing and selling, um, you know, houses? 
Oh, well, yes. Sometimes not as frequently, but every now and again, we do get calls about perceptions of steering. Uh, um, the idea that a person desires to see that have a greater or more open access to the types of houses that they're looking at. And, you know, every now and again, it's a question or concern about whether or not they were presented all of the options that they qualified to act that they were qualified to access. So that's probably the most consistent um, trend associated with actual real estate agencies or realtors per se. Um, one of the things that started to emerge as a result of COVID, um, which I don't perceive would be an ongoing issue, but it definitely was in the beginning, was the use of PPE in showing homes as, um, as to whether or not certain homes of certain value or certain um, clients who had hired realtors to market and sell their homes whether or not the PPE restrictions were being taken as seriously based on uh, protected class status. Mm -hmm. So we're, um, I know that in more than one instance, um, there were accusations based on the use of um, ring doorbells um, and video cameras around properties showing that realtors were either inconsistent depending upon who they were showing the home to or whether or not they were like fully gloved, fully masked, had the uh, protective uh, gear on their feet, et cetera. And so um, we did get some, some, some inquiry about, you know, what is it that, that is permissible, what's not permissible. Um, I had realtors contact me directly and ask me, you know, can I be held responsible? You know, is this really an issue of like, can I be dinged for like discrimination if I forget? The surface answer was, does it, does it ultimately become discriminatory? No, but um, can it be discriminatory if you're observed doing it differently across other dwellings? Yes. <laughs> Um, or if you're doing it differently, depending upon your clients, yes. And so um, definitely, again, COVID created all kinds of nuances in the world of discriminate, you know, discrimination investigation. And so for some, for real, for realtors, that was something that was kind of called on the carpet. Great, Heather, you there? Yep. Well, thank okay. you so much. I think I think that's all the questions that we have. Lots of great information. That's it's definitely a good reminder for everyone to continue to mask up and follow the CDC guidelines when they're showing property too to all your clients for every property. Um, as a thank you, we are donating in your honor the Girl Who Drank the Moon, a book by Kelly Barnhill to our adopted school, Hunter Elementary. Excellent. So thank you so much again for coming on. And then um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Jones after this, we'll, we'll send out her information. And that was great. I really appreciate your time and speaking with us today. So thank you. Again, thank you so much for having me. And I definitely look forward to any follow-up conversations. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.